Well, the book of Acts is about what happens next. Um, after Jesus has died and resurrected, what happens in the early church? It's a kind of history of the early church. It's written by the same person who writes the book of Luke, so that scholars sometimes talk about Luke Acts as just one continuous narrative. Uh, we can't be sure that Luke wrote it, but most scholars, certainly most British scholars, believe that he was the author of it because um, certain sections of Acts are called the we sections because um, the, the writer doesn't say they did this and they did that, but we did this and we did that. So even if it was a later writer, then it's certainly based on Luke's diaries and takes Luke's first-hand sources. And therefore Luke, who is a Greek-speaking person, probably one, perhaps the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament, um, he certainly wrote most of Acts, if not all of it. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving the instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the author here is referring back to his first book, which is the Gospel, in this case of Luke, um, with this as being some sort of sequel. Uh, so in the first book it was about the life of Jesus himself, uh, and in this sequel in Acts it's about the life of uh, the church, if you like, the spread of the early church, taking out the message about Jesus. So in some sense you could say this is what Je Jesus continues to do through his disciples as they take his, the message about him throughout the world. And it's interesting that some of the things that Jesus do does in the, the Gospels, uh, the, the Apostles do in Acts. So for example, uh, the raising of a dead person, um, various miracles. Peter, for example, heals people. His shadow heals people, so he only has to walk past people and people in the shadow will be healed. Which oh, is, well, we better let that... Yes. <laughs> you, that dog of yours? Come along. Do you want to go in or out? Do you want to go out? Time, is it? it may be. It doesn't mean she necessarily wants a bathroom. It yeah, there's some bizarre stories, um, uh, but the key thing really is about the spread of the church, and ultimately we, we do see this effect because now we know that the church is an international um, body. The message of, uh, about Jesus as Messiah has been spread uh, around the world. And um, So what we see is actually Luke as the author um, shows this gradual spread of uh, the message about Jesus from Jerusalem right to, well, becoming universal. He's keen to show it becomes universal. Luke, Luke has a very interesting mental map. The mental map is a circle, and, in the, and that circle is the city of Jerusalem, and big in the centre of that city is the temple. And then he has another circle outside that, and that's Judea and Samaria. And that's the world of the Old Testament. That's the world of Revelation. That's the world of, the, of where, where the Lord has spoken down the centuries. And then out on the border of that is, is, is the city of Antioch. And up to that point, everyone is supposed to know that Jesus, who Jesus is because they're supposed to know the background. And then there, Antioch forms the boundary because there suddenly they become no longer just a group among the chosen people, but they become a group out in the world, and they're called Christians, and then it goes out to the ends of the earth. And several times he uses this phrase, out to the ends of the earth, and he thinks of the ends of the earth as somewhere very far in the east, and then out around Gibraltar. So at the very end of his book, he has a hint that Paul has started in Jerusalem, he's preached all the way, and now he's even reached the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts contains some, some rather famous stories. I guess one of the most famous stories is um, the conversion of Saul. Saul was a Hellenistic Jew, so in other words a Greek-speaking Jew who'd persecuted the early Christians terribly and then on the road to Damascus ha um, has a vision of a blinding light. He is blinded. Um, and he is converted to be a follower of Jesus Christ and uh, he becomes the, the writer of many New Testament letters, Paul, 
And so we talk today about Damascus moments, the moments of revelation or moments of conversion. This is all going back to um, the conversion of Paul on the road to, to Damascus. Yep. Here we are, Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, that's equivalent to the Sunday, when we, that's Luke, met to make bread, to, to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them, that's the Christians at Ephesus, when he intended to leave the next day, and he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where they were meeting, but a young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and, bending over him, took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, this life is still in him. And Paul went upstairs, and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them. Yet a longer sermon after all that. The moral of that story is to me, he did long, boring sermons. <laughs> I think Eutychus found it boring. I don't suppose anybody else found it boring. <laughs> I'm talking again about the book of Acts and the very beginning. Acts gives us um, some insight into what the life of the very first Christians was like. And it does tell us just one or two little things about what they did uh, together and how they understood the message of Jesus that they'd learned from his life. Uh, two things in particular. Um, we're told in chapter 2 that the first Christians met for fellowship, for teaching, and for the breaking of bread and the prayers. So what we see in churches now, almost every Sunday in, 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 most, in many, many churches, is that they share this communion service, this bread and wine that uh, Roman Catholics and some Anglicans call the Mass, the Eucharist. And of course that goes back to the Last Supper, to Jesus sharing the Passover meal with his disciples, breaking bread and passing around a cup of wine. But we're told that the disciples, right from the very beginning, follow Jesus' commandment to do this in his memory, and they're doing it here in the book of Acts. They're breaking bread, they're sharing that meal, the meal that Christians now celebrate week in, week out, day in, day out, today, um, in sharing the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ. And the second thing that we're told, right at the end of chapter 2, is that um, the apostles, those first Christians, were living together and sharing all things in common. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. So that's the idea of a, which you know we see depicted in art and we'll see um, in churches, on church banners and altar frontals and vestments and so on. But, uh, it sounds really exciting, F tongues of fire and things. Tongues of fire, I think it's, um, I think the only other thing to say about tongues of fire is that it, that is, if we think about it, such a terrifying image and yet the church has kind of sanitised that. If you, you know, go into a church and look at embroidery on an altar frontal, look at the vestments, you'll often see you know, nice little flames embroidered around the place. And yet the image of people actually being on fire. Acts, I think many scholars think that Acts is, there's a lot of historical material in Acts and at the same time it's probably not perfectly accurate history and in some sense there's an idealization of the life of the early church, but a very important one because the church ever afterwards has tested itself. Are we living up to the model that Acts set out of a church should be communal, equal, things like that? Ananias and Sapphira, now this is um, chapter 5, and this is the, would you like me to read it? Or, Well, it's a story, um, and there are a number of interesting things here. Um, the idea is that in the earliest, you know, this Christian community that we're considering here at the beginning of the book of Acts, that people were sharing their goods in common, and those who possessed land or property were selling their property and they were giving the proceeds of their sale to Peter, who was the leader of the community. 
Um, now Ananias and Sapphira had a piece of property and they decided to sell it, but they decided that they would only give some of the money that they had um, got through the, per through the sale of their property to Peter and they would keep some back. And uh, what happened was um, Ananias, who was the chap, um, presented Peter with the money and Peter, because he could obviously see into people's hearts, said, you're deceiving me here, you know, you have not given the full value of this um, property to me, uh, you've kept some back. And he zaps him and he basically drops dead. Uh, and then three hours later, Sapphira comes along and Peter says to her, well, did you give the full value of the property that you sold? And she presumably says yes, and he says, I know that you didn't, and uh, she gets zapped as well. Uh, so that's the end of her. Uh, now this obviously raises a whole host of questions, doesn't it? Because it seems to be, uh, well, a terrible model for church leadership, if I may say. Um, and also it's a kind of healing miracle in reverse, isn't it? because we're used to the idea of Jesus going around healing people. And here we have Peter, the leader of the community, going around, um, you know, bringing about people's death. 